Hello and welcome to the Political History of the United States, Episode 3.26, Enter George Washington. Last time, we spent our episode looking at the rapidly evolving situation in the Ohio country, a situation that was quickly approaching a potential breaking point when the Marquis Duquesne decided that the forks of the Ohio was a nice place to build a fort. The British obviously agreed that it was prime real estate, as they also had plans to build a fort in the same location. However, before we can press forward with the seemingly inevitable conflict forming along the Ohio, we need to pause to introduce a new player to our story. You cannot tell the story of what is about to happen in the Ohio country, and specifically at the forks of the Ohio, without George Washington. Now, we do actually have just a bit more in the narrative we need to cover before Washington actually makes his official appearance in our story. However, considering what an absolute giant he is going to be moving forward, I felt that it was important that we take a short break from our narrative and give Washington the formal introduction that he demands. George is not our first Washington to come up on this podcast. Previously on the political history of the United States, we met John Washington. John Washington first appeared back in episode 2.8, when he was a colonel in the Virginia militia. The elder Washington was accused of leading a massacre against the Susquehannock tribe, an event that was critical in the run-up to Bacon's Rebellion. John Washington was an interesting figure. He was called out by Governor Berkeley, a move that did nothing but inflame the population at large and further isolate the increase in the unpopular governor. Washington would see a small surge of popularity as people viewed him as somebody who was at least willing to address the Indian threat along the frontier. John Washington himself would claim that the massacre was something completely out of his control and that it had been the accompanying troops from Maryland who were really the guilty parties. John Washington's oldest son, Lawrence Washington, was born in 1659 to himself and Am Pope. When Lawrence was just 18 years old, John Washington died. Lawrence was a lawyer by trade and was involved in local politics. Following the death of his father, Lawrence would inherit a rather large amount of land, including a holding near the Potomac called the Little Hunting Creek. John Washington had shown real interest in the land during his life and had taken advantage of what was still a lucrative headright system in Virginia. Through the importation of indentured servants, John Washington had grown a substantial estate for future generations. It would be that holding at Little Hunting Creek, the largest holding owned by the Washingtons, that would one day transform into Mount Vernon. Unfortunately for Lawrence Washington, he too would have a rather short life, dying in 1698. Drain Washington's marriage to Mildred Warner, he would have three children. The middle child, Augustine Washington, was born in 1694, some four years before Lawrence himself would die. Augustine Washington, a tobacco farmer by trade, sat atop some 1,100 acres of his own, as well as an additional 1,750 that came along with his first wife, Jane Butler. Augustine had three children from the marriage, Lawrence, Augustine Jr., and Jane. There had been a fourth child as well, who died prior to his first birthday. In 1731, tragedy struck the family when Jane Butler died. Augustine was many things. However, one thing that he was completely unprepared to be was a single father to young children. A year following the death of his first wife, Augustine married Mary Ball. Mary Ball was born in 1708 though she was a very stubborn woman who would do much to frustrate George Washington later in his life, she was unquestionably a very hard worker. There was little indication from the upbringing of Mary Ball of what her son would one day become. Ball was about as far removed from high society in Virginia as one could imagine. On February 22, 1732, George Washington was born. The eldest son of Augustine and Mary, George Washington would enter the world with three elder step-siblings. Including his step-siblings, George Washington was one of nine children of Augustine, 
who he would have between his two wives. George Washington would outlive all of them. When just three years old, George and the rest of his family moved to the little hunting creek off the Potomac. This would become Washington's home for much of the rest of his life. As had become something of a tradition in the Washington family, Augustine died in 1743 at the age of just 48. This had a profound impact on the young George Washington, beyond the grief that inevitably comes with the loss of a parent. More pragmatically, it meant that George would be denied the formal education that his elder brothers had received. This would remain a sore point for Washington, as he would always feel inferior because of his lack of formal education, something made even more pronounced considering some of the intellectual giants that Washington would surround himself with. Now, to be sure, this is not to in any way suggest that George Washington was dumb. He clearly wasn't. Records indeed do show that Washington had at least some formal education, and he was known to love reading. What he lacked, however, was the more polished educational credentials of his future colleagues. Nobody was ever going to confuse George Washington's intellectual abilities with that of Jefferson, Hamilton, or Adams, something that Washington was acutely aware of and rather self-conscious about. Following the death of his father, it was Lawrence who inherited the future Mount Vernon. George himself would inherit Ferry Farm, as well as his first ten slaves. George Washington is going to come to have a complicated relationship with slavery. Ultimately, he is going to end up enslaving over 300 people. Washington would become somewhat emblematic of a specific view of the practice that became common amongst the founders. Washington disliked the practice of slavery. However, he could not personally extricate himself from it, at least during his lifetime. We are going to talk much more in the seasons to come about the relationship between the founders and the institution of slavery so I'm not planning to go far down that path right now, but it is something to keep in mind as we are going to keep coming back to it. The death of Augustine also meant more than the loss of a chance at a formal education. Mary Ball Washington can be described as overbearing, and based on his later writings with her, there is little to suggest that George Washington ever shared much of a close relationship with his mother. Not that there was anything like an estrangement between the two, Rather, the relationship that remained between Mary and her eldest son lacked much in the way of warmth. The tense relationship meant that Washington was naturally pushed closer to his older brothers for guidance. George looked up to his older half-brother Lawrence the most. It was Lawrence whom we had briefly mentioned a few episodes ago during our time talking about the War of Jenkins' Ear. Lawrence Washington clearly maintained a good enough impression of Admiral Vernon that upon his return to Virginia, he renamed the Little Hunting Lodge to the now much more recognized moniker of Mount Vernon. It is likewise interesting to think of how the stories of his older brother may have left a long-lasting impression on George Washington. With his father dying at such a young age, when George was a boy of only about 11, it would have been his brothers that George would have had to look to for a fatherly figure. It was through Lawrence that George would be introduced into the world of Virginia high society. Lawrence married Anne Fairfax. The Fairfax family was about as influential as you could get in 18th century Virginia. Deeply tied to the government of the colony, the Fairfax family had their hands on every aspect of colonial life. While it was a major leap of social mobility for Lawrence, it also proved to be a boon to the young George Washington. With the marriage, George now found himself with an invitation into the Virginia High Society. George Washington would indeed become a frequent visitor of the family home at Belvoir. Equally important for George Washington is that the family patriarch, Colonel William Fairfax, took an immediate liking to him. The Fairfax family would become a critical connection for George Washington in his youth. He would spend significant time at Belvoir, where he honed his manners and learned how to conduct himself as a true Virginia gentleman. This is also where George would meet Sally Fairfax. Sally Fairfax married the son of Colonel William Fairfax, also named George. George Fairfax was a close friend of George Washington's during his youth. However, of note, 
Washington seemed to be enamored with Sally Fairfax, and through their writings, she certainly seems pretty fond of him as well. What is unknown is how far things between George Washington and Sally Fairfax progressed. We know from the surviving correspondence that George Washington seems to have been more interested in a relationship than with Sally. While Sally Fairfax absolutely seems to have engaged with some playful banter, bordering on conspicuous flirting, there is no evidence that the relationship ever became something more physical. Sensing that George Washington had a great deal of potential, and eager to get him away from the control of his mother, William Fairfax and Lawrence Washington hatched a plan to have George head off and join the Royal Navy. Despite giving her tacit initial approval of the plan, Mary Ball Washington would end up reversing course before George could leave. With a military career apparently scuttled, George Washington turned to surveying as a potential career path. This made sense for the young man. Washington was good at math. He enjoyed the outdoors, and if there was one thing not lacking in North America, it was land. With the rapid colonial expansion into new areas, such as the Shenandoah Valley and the Ohio country, it is not as though there was a lack of surveying work to be done. Furthermore, Washington's father had left George a full set of surveying equipment. By the time that George Washington was 16, he was busy helping fence fields and had become an exceptionally good horseman. During those early years of surveying, Washington writes about the difficult conditions that he faced, and immediately his raw physical abilities become apparent. Washington would write about working long days battling the elements. In one particularly miserable diary entry, Washington writes of a room that he stayed in. Washington describes going to bed on a mattress made up of a small amount of straw and a single threadbare blanket. More horrifyingly is Washington's description of the vermin and lice that he also was sharing the bed with. Well, to be sure, Washington was happy to get out of the bed and would later write about how happy he was to bathe. It illustrates something of a dichotomy for the future American president. Washington was absolutely focused on the idea of upward mobility. He wanted desperately to be a Virginia gentleman and fit in with that lifestyle that he got to witness while at Belvoir. However, Washington always had an undeniable push to remain an outdoorsman. It was half a century after sleeping in this lice-infested bed that a horseback ride during a cold December rainstorm would cause the illness that would rapidly lead to the death of the first president. As we move through his life methodically on this podcast, we are going to time and time again see Washington move between the rugged outdoorsman and the country gentleman. And while this was not entirely rare for the time, George Fairfax was along on this trip as well. It helps us paint a picture of who George Washington is and who he would become. In 1749, George Washington became the surveyor for Culpeper County. Whereas earlier jobs had netted him some money here and there, it was this job that would put Washington on the path towards a measure of economic security. Despite this, however, not all was good for George Washington. Lawrence Washington's health was in decline, likely from tuberculosis. In 1751, George and Lawrence Washington took a trip to Barbados, hoping that it would improve his overall health. The trip failed in that end and would prove to be the only time that George Washington would ever travel abroad. For his trouble, George Washington would contract smallpox while in Barbados. And while he would obviously survive the ordeal, it would leave him with a lifetime of light scarring. For Lawrence, the trip did little. And on July 26, 1752, Lawrence Washington died at Mount Vernon. Well, devastated at the loss of his brother, it would prove to be consequential for George Washington. Lawrence had stipulated that if his daughter, Sarah Washington, died without an heir, Mount Vernon would pass to George. In 1754, Sarah Washington died, and in 1761, Anne Fairfax, Lawrence's widow, would also pass away, thus giving George Washington complete control over the estate that would so become connected to him. 
If you're curious why Mount Vernon did not pass instead to Augustine Jr., here is the reason. The original plan by Augustine Sr. was that should Lawrence die without heirs, everybody would basically just upgrade. Augustine Jr. would take Mount Vernon, and his holding at Pope's Creek would transfer to George. However, Augustine Jr. was not interested in parting with his Pope Creek property and therefore allowed himself to be skipped over for ownership of Mount Vernon. With that, George Washington had a new home. By the 1750s, George Washington saw his star rising in Virginia. His close relationship with the Fairfax family had given him powerful backers in the Virginia government. Timely deaths in the family, though emotionally rough on the young man, meant that he possessed a growing amount of property and things certainly seem to be looking up for him. At this point, I'm going to pause our biography of George Washington. Yes, there is still a tremendous amount to cover about his life, something that we are going to be doing as we move forward in the story. We have yet to introduce Martha Dandridge into the equation, so obviously we still have some paths left to follow. However, that is all in the future. Our story right now is about the French and Indian War. Therefore, our focus needs to turn to getting to the question of exactly how George Washington would get swept up into the conflict. To begin this story, we need to return to the formation of the Ohio Company. The Washingtons had been involved with the speculative boom going on in the Ohio country for some time now. Lawrence Washington was one of the original members of the Ohio Company Charter and has been hanging out on the fringes of the events that we have been talking about during our last two episodes. Lawrence had been amongst those who had been advocating for a fort to be built at the Forks of the Ohio. So it is not as though George Washington is all that far removed from the events of the Ohio country. While tensions had been on the rise since the end of King George's War, the provocation of the Marquis Duquesne was the kind of thing that London could not ignore. In Europe itself, this manifested in a series of alliances set to check French aggression. Predictably, the concern was that any kind of fighting in North America would largely spill out into a greater European conflict. As we have seen a few times now, in the eyes of London, North America was some mere backwater compared to the much more significant threat of European warfare. Enter into our story, Lord Halifax, who had been watching the situation with particular concern. Halifax recognized the need to check French expansion in North America, and had been hearing from the colonial governors over their concerns about the suddenly expansionist French. Halifax was in frequent correspondence with Virginia Lieutenant Governor Robert Dinwiddie, who warned him about the French incursion into the Ohio country. Dinwiddie was the acting governor of the colony. The actual governor, if you're curious, was Willem Ann Van Keppel, the Earl of Albemarle. Keppel never actually stepped foot into Virginia, nor any of the North American colonies for that sake, and was a completely absentee governor. Keppel, therefore, really is not that important, and you can go ahead and promptly forget that I ever mentioned his name. Though it does hopefully explain why Dinwiddie was running the show. The threat of French expansion into the Ohio country was taken seriously enough that by the end of August 1753, the North American colonies were told in no uncertain terms that they were to protect the British frontier from the French. In the official instructions, there is lip service paid to not being the aggressor. However, it also mentions that if anybody should interfere with the British trying to ramp up frontier defenses, the interference should be considered an act of aggression. This call to action essentially means that confrontation at the forks of the Ohio was now inevitable. Now, it is interesting to note that it is not entirely clear that London fully understood the borders of North America. Yes, Virginia was making a claim on the Ohio country. They also had a claim that went all the way to California just because they said it was theirs, did not exactly make it true. That being said, however, Halifax had an increasingly influential voice and his correspondence with Dinwiddie 
was what was getting played back in London. Dinwiddie himself was not exactly a neutral observer here either, considering that he was also an investor in the Ohio Company. Throughout North America, the colonies were making the initial preparations for a potential conflict. These preparations took on a couple of different forms. To the North, it meant an attempt to repair the relationship with the Iroquois Confederacy. James Delancey began making plans to hold a congress in Albany, where he hoped to mend relations with the Iroquois and, more specifically, the all-important Mohawk. This conference, which would become known as the Albany Congress, would prove to be a somewhat unique event in colonial history and is going to have some long-lasting effects, if more in its form than actual function. Now, for right now, I want you to know that this is going on at roughly the same time as the other events that we are talking about, specifically in that time frame right before the war, when the British colonists were trying to figure out exactly who their allies were. The Albany Congress, however, deserves more time and attention than I can give it this week, without risking the episode ballooning. So, for now, just know that the planning for the Albany Congress was going on contemporaneously to the events that we have already started talking about. I plan to return to the Congress itself next time and give it the attention that it really deserves. While the Albany Congress is being planned up in the North, down in Virginia decisions had to be made on what to do. If conflict came, which at this point looks very possible, Virginia was going to find themselves thrust right into the middle of it. After all, it is their claim that is apparently being violated. Dinwiddie is writing to Halifax directly of the worsening conditions and is the one making pleas for help. However, as to the specifics of exactly what the response was going to entail, well, that proved to be a much more complicated subject. One of the most critical things to understand is that the British colonies were not a single unit. Today, when we think of the states, we think of them as eternal partners. They've always been intrinsically linked to one another, and those bonds holding them together are both ancient and essentially eternal. Now, at a surface level, we of course know that this is not true. After all, during the 1860s, the bonds between the states were anything but eternal. Beyond that, it is not as though 1861 was the first real secession crisis that the nation had faced, though obviously it is the most serious by leaps and bounds. During the 1750s, the colonies were still very much separate entities. Did they trade with one another and economically rely upon each other? Absolutely. However, they were at the same time competitors. They competed for economic gain, resources and, in this moment, land. As we are going to see next time, the Albany Congress is going to mark a high water point for pre-1760s colonial cooperation. Virginia, however, was not having any of it. So why would Virginia not want to take place in a gathering of the colonies? And, specific to our episode today, what does any of this have to do with a 21-year-old George Washington. Virginia was, at this point, playing a complicated game. Sure, having a voice at the Albany Congress would be great. However, with a gathering of colonies, it could well mean that Virginia was going to be forced to compromise. Prior to the Albany Congress, Dinwiddie had been reassured that he would receive enough supplies that the fort down near the forks of the Ohio would be well-provisioned for a fight. Knowing this, Dinwiddie, who again was a shareholder in the Ohio Company, decided against sending delegates to Albany. For Dinwiddie, he wanted to ensure that Virginia was in complete control over its own frontiers. Going to Albany would have likely forced Virginia to compromise with Pennsylvania, who was also looking to claim the land in question. Aware that he had supplies and reinforcements coming and ready to wage war at the forks of the Ohio, Dinwiddie found himself with very little reason to compromise with his biggest competitor in the region. Dinwiddie was not exactly being honest with those inside of his colony either, and appears to have really limited the role of the House of Burgesses in making the decision here. This was likely because those within the House of Burgesses 
may not have felt such a deep connection to the Ohio company, and were not jumping at the chance to provide the company with a competitive advantage. Many of those inside the Virginia House of Burgesses had stakes in other speculative land companies dealing with the Ohio country, companies that were in direct competition with Dinwiddie's own Ohio company. Okay, so Dinwiddie, knowing that he was going to be fully provisioned at the Forks of the Ohio, decided to strike against the French, right? Well, no, that didn't happen. Unfortunately for Dinwiddie, he lacked the political capital himself to get the House of Burgesses to agree to fund such an aggressive move. The problem for Dinwiddie is that for the past several years, he had been involved in a Virginia political scandal that had him clashing with the House of Burgesses. Now, don't worry about the scandal itself. It's not important for our story. All you need to worry about here is the fact that Dinwiddie lacked the political capital necessary to lead any kind of offensive campaign. And if you are saying to yourself that, hey, wasn't Dinwiddie cutting out the House of Burgesses? It was more that he was being less than honest with them. He still needed their funding if he was going to lead any kind of attack at the Forks of the Ohio. To summarize his position, therefore, Dinwiddie wanted nothing to do with the Albany Congress because he knew that he would have the provisions necessary to fight the French at the Forks of the Ohio without having to compromise and partner with Pennsylvania. At the same time, he lacked the political capital to actually launch the attack to force the French from the region. Dinwiddie, therefore, needed to come up with a different plan a plan that could simultaneously press his advantage while not actually setting off a full-scale conflict. Wanting to avoid the compromises that would have come with attending the Albany Congress, but lacking the power to expel the French at the moment, Dinwiddie turned to the diplomatic option. Dinwiddie chose to send an emissary out to confront the French, present them with those orders from George II, and make clear that it was time to leave. The emissary's job, therefore, was to ride out, tell the French that they were trespassing, and point them towards the exit. It was an improbable, if not outright impossible, task, to say the least. Besides informing the French that George II meant business, the emissary was also to make contact with the local Iroquois in order to gather intelligence about the French, as well as scout out an ideal location for a fort to further prevent French machinations in the region. Possibly the most important part of this mission was attempting to shore up those relations with the Iroquois. Despite the fact that Virginia was not going to attend the Congress at Albany, the Iroquois remained a critical partner in Virginia's overall plans in the Ohio country. The Virginians still needed to work with the Iroquois, and skipping out on Albany meant that they needed to secure a separate alliance. This was, of course, not going to be an easy task as the Iroquois were not exactly thrilled at the prospect of further French incursion into their territories. For this emissary, Dinwiddie turned to none other than a 21-year-old George Washington. This is obviously a critical mission, and it may seem strange at first that Dinwiddie would turn towards such a young man to lead it. However, Washington did provide a handful of advantages. First, as a surveyor, he had a good grasp of the land. He was used to arduous travels and spending long periods of time living outdoors. He likewise had a considerable connection to the Ohio Company through his brother Lawrence, who was a major shareholder. This is to say nothing of the fact that Washington likely also came with a vote of confidence from the influential Colonel William Fairfax. Still a young man, Washington jumped at the opportunity to carry out such a critical mission. Accompanying Washington on the journey was Christopher Gist, the traitor whom we had met during our last episode. On October 31, 1753, George Washington departed on the first major mission of his life, carrying orders signed by King George II. He had been given the task of establishing diplomatic contacts with the Iroquois, scouting a site for a new fort, and delivering a warning to the French. Just like that, George Washington would officially make his debut on the world stage. 
a place that he would remain for the rest of his life. Next time, we will pick up and look at how this first critical mission for Washington would turn out. We are also going to travel to upstate New York and take a closer look at the Albany Congress, an event that would prove to have a significant influence both in present and future events for the colonies. Until then, I hope you all have an excellent two weeks. I hope that you are staying healthy and staying safe. And I will see you back here next time as we watch North America inch ever closer to war. <laughs>